Good morning. Welcome to my class of uh, model-based software design. I am Massimo Violante. I will be your teacher for this class uh, throughout this semester. Uh, today, I want to go through this introduction uh, to the course slides because I want to explain first why I decided to put together this kind of course and I uh, presenting the material that is inside this course. And then uh, I will give you some administrative, administrative issues, uh, information about uh, uh, the exam, uh, the teaching material, and so on and so forth. Uh, so let me first uh, start uh, with uh, the description of the purpose of this course. So as the name suggests, uh, we are dealing here with model-based software design. What is this name stands for? Well, model-based software design is a new approach to develop embedded software that is uh, becoming more and more uh, uh, popular in a number of um, domains. This is because, as we'll see later on during the class, uh, we have that most uh, of our application today, whether they are from uh, automotive domain, uh, industrial domain, uh, biomedical domain, uh, aerospace domain, are most of most of the case most often uh, implemented using these new techniques that uh, allows you to avoid writing uh, uh, C code uh, as we learn uh, in the first uh, uh, part of um, the teaching here at Politecnico. So. Uh, this kind of uh, skill is very important for you that you uh, enter the work uh, um, industry in uh, maybe one year from now or even less if you are more uh, ahead in your, uh, uh, in your um, classes. So it's very important that you understand these two techniques because it can be a plus for your CV when you apply for a job. Uh, in this course, I'm focusing on the automotive. We will see in a minute why this is relevant. Um, taking the class of model-based software design uh, will also lead us to uh, understand concepts that are relevant for the automotive industries, like AutoSAR and ISO 26262. For the moment, they are just a uh, acronym that doesn't tell you nothing. Well, we will learn about them uh, later on in the class. The point is that what I'm trying to give you here is uh, a view of the design activity that is not just, uh, let's start with uh, the blank uh, sheet of paper and start drawing something, but this, uh, um, let's say, I'm trying to give you a way, a standardized way, a, a, let me say, a regulated way for address the design. This will help us a lot when dealing with the type of um, uh, applications that uh, we will uh, face uh, uh, looking into the automotive domain. But it is the same concept that you can apply under different acronyms uh, in the industry domain, in the uh, biomedical domain, in the aerospace domain. So I think that uh, taking automotive as example is a good way for learning techniques uh, that can be used with different names in other domains. So I hope this will give you a plus when you uh, apply for a job. So why we look into the um, automotive uh, applications? Well, this shall give you an, an idea of the magnitude of the problem that we have to deal with. Uh, let's focus just on a very, let me say, stupid metric to quantify the complexity of uh, a manufact. Let's consider the lines of code. So um, if you are not aware yet of this, uh, it will become much more clear when we go deeper in the class. But let me say that uh, whichever application you might think of, there is a computer behind. Think about the space shuttle. Think about uh, the F-22 Raptor. This is a um, fighter uh, airplane. Think about the Space Telescope, uh, the Mars Curiosity rover. This is a rover that is uh, crawling on Mars. Think about the Boeing 787, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, a car. Well, these are all applications coming from uh, science, aerospace, 
from automotive, well, all these applications are powered by computers. These are not the computers that we are used to know. These are not the computers that we have on our uh, desktop. These are embedded computers. So these are computers designed for a specific purpose. You cannot download a video with that computers, but you can run an airplane, you can run a, a, a high energy physics experiments like uh, the LHC, you can uh, drive a car, you can drive a rover. All of these are computers. Well, as it is uh, obvious, whichever the computer uh, we are looking at, there is software running there. Well, if you want to analyze the complexity of that computer and the type of application that is run by that computer, you can have a look at uh, how many lines of code uh, are needed for uh, uh, writing the application that uh, um, is running on that computer. So in this chart that uh, you can find on Google, uh, somebody take the time to prepare this uh, uh, bar chart that compares different types of uh, software uh, applications in terms of uh, millions of lines of code. And here you can find something, uh, I think, surprising for the, the most of us. Uh, Space Shuttle, it is something uh, uh, that resembles science fiction. It's a spacecraft that can be shipped to space, uh, bringing human in orbit for doing some uh, uh, advanced uh, operations like uh, putting in orbit a satellite, uh, docking with uh, an, already, an already deployed uh, satellite like uh, the Hubble Space Telescope to do maintenance. And then when everything is done, uh, uh, the ship can uh, come back to the Earth like a normal plane. Well, this is science fiction. Well, let's see how many lines of code are there. Well, it is probably in the range of one million of code. Uh, if we move forward in this uh, analysis, we can see that uh, um, a modern airplane like the Boeing 787 has much more lines of code than this uh, science fiction stuff. We are in the range of, uh, I would say, 12 million lines of code. Well, <clears throat> if we continue to analyze this, we can see that uh, even Facebook is more uh, complex in terms of lines of code than the code needed to fly an airplane. We are in the range of uh, more than 60 million of lines of code. But then let's have a look at the car. With a car, we have uh, roughly 100 millions of lines of code. This is code that somebody has to write. This is code that somebody has to validate. This is code that somebody has to put at work on a car that is uh, allowing you to drive at 150 kilometers per hour on the highway. So the amount of code that uh, you have to deploy on a vehicle is uh, huge. And as you will see, this code is responsible for the life of the occupants of the car and the people that are around the car. So you cannot think of writing this code with uh, diesis include the standard io.h and then uh, starts writing your code. It is not possible. It's not possible because uh, uh, writing code in that way is too prone to errors then uh, most of the time this code uh, is not uh, doing uh, fancy stuff as the one that uh, we learned during computer programming. This is something that has to keep an engine revolving. This is something that has to uh, keep the car braking properly when the driver brakes, uh, and so on and so forth. So most of the time this code is not written by a computer scientists. This is written by people that has expertise on uh, engine, propulsion, uh, maybe gearbox, uh, suspension, braking, and so on and so forth. And these people normally doesn't like to use C programming, okay? So to cope with the growing complexity of software that is needed for uh, a number of applications, and automotive is uh, probably 
um, the most relevant example here in terms of complexity, we have to look for a different approach. And this is what I try to give you in this class. Uh, the software is becoming dominant. There is an analysis uh, uh, from Mercedes uh, that has been uh, published a couple of years ago that uh, tries to quantify the value uh, in terms of innovation um, that, uh, can, that the different technologies can bring to a vehicle. Uh, can you guess which is the most important aspect for bringing innovations into vehicles? Well, it is not engine. It is not uh, design. It is not uh, active suspensions. Nothing that we know from the, let me say, classical uh, disciplines uh, like mechanics, uh, energy, and so on and so forth. Uh, according to a big car maker, most of the innovation in vehicles will come from software. So, no brainer, software is here, it will be here much and more in the next uh, future, and uh, we have to cope with it. The problem is that this is not uh, the software that we have uh, on our laptop or on our smartphone, that uh, when it uh, stops working, who cares? We just uh, power off and power on again, and we are uh, up and running again. This is not the case. This is software that must run always. Otherwise, your uh, plane will crash, you will not be able to brake, the airbag will not open when you have uh, an incident. So this is software that is crucial. And we have to understand how to design this in the proper way. The problem is that the complexity is growing. We have 100 million of lines of gold, no way of uh, uh, being able to survive that amount of complexity if we do not have a structured process towards the development of this software. And uh, this is covered by the ISO 26262 topic in this class. Uh, as we will see later on, this is an international standard, is an ISO standard, so this is an international standard uh, that tells you how you shall approach the design of uh, electronics and electrical parts uh, that have to be deployed on a vehicle. So this is a process. This is a way that uh, the automotive industry recognizes to be the best practice in developing embedded system in vehicle. So for this, we have prescription that tell us how to analyze the system that we have to design, how to design it uh, in terms of uh, defining the architecture, defining different components within this architecture, in terms of how to test what we are uh, designing. And this is something that will be a must in the automotive industry. This is uh, something that is today a standard that everybody has to comply with. So if you want to find a, a future in the automotive industry, maybe this is something that is good to, play, to put on your CV. Uh, then, as we said, uh, we have the issue of writing the code, but we don't want to write C code. So we have to find a different approach. We will learn how we can do this using uh, the model-driven design. So we are not going to write code, we are going to specify behaviors of controllers, in terms of uh, um, transformation of input data into output data through filtering or uh, um, simple, I would say simple, arithmetic blocks. Uh, we will look into a way of specifying uh, time-dependent behaviors uh, through fitness state machines. All of this will be modeled and simulated using a, a proper uh, software tool that is Simulink. Uh, and then, when we are happy with uh, what we have, we will learn how to translate uh, this model into code automatically. This is the plus. We are not going to write C code. Somebody will automatically write the code for us, starting from a model. And then, we will look, in, uh, we will look uh, into a way uh, to model our software architectures. This is something that is required by the standard, so we, 
we cannot just say, ah, I want to have uh, two software components that interact in this way, and we use an informal notation for that. This is not possible. When entering the, um, in the industry, you will be part of a team. The biggest issue there is, be, is to be able to communicate, so to be able to interact effectively with the other members of the team. This requires a common language, better if the language is formal. And this is why we will look into AutoSAR. AutoSAR is a de facto standard for uh, specifying the architecture of software within uh, um, automotive applications. And this is something that uh, you will be asked to use if by chance uh, you enter in this uh, automotive business and you are asked to uh, become a software architect. Uh, so maybe not all of you will uh, deal with that uh, when exiting Politecnico, but some of you may be uh, involved in this stuff. And uh, the other, the rest of you that enters the automotive domain sooner or later will face AutoSAR as user or uh, as author. So better to have an understanding of what this is. Then after uh, all I said, uh, you may wonder why. So why do we have to uh, address uh, all these topics? Uh, why the teacher is uh, trying to convince me to buy the content of this class? Well, this is, simply speaking, uh, a matter of uh, looking uh, a bit ahead in time and uh, uh, taking into consideration the fact that uh, you will uh, exit Polytechnic sooner or later. I hope for you sooner than later. But uh, uh, typically, when you exit Politecnico, what do you do? Well, besides some, uh, let's say, uh, the compression period on uh, seaside or whatever you like to enjoy your time off, you will be busy writing CV and asking for jobs. So you will submit uh, your CV and you will look for interviews for being hired by somebody. If you look at South Politecnico and you want to stay in the perimeter of Italy, I would say even the perimeter of Torino, not, not moving too far from Torino, this is a, a not exhaustive list of companies that are looking for new graduates um, that are uh, active in the automotive industry. We have a big OEM here. OEM start, stands for uh, Original Equipment Manufacturer. So OEM is a, an OEM is a company that builds vehicles. It could be passenger cars, like in the case of FCA or General Motors. It could be industrial machines or uh, uh, passenger bus, like uh, CNH Industrial. So these are companies ready for hiring you. Then we have, uh, I would call them uh, tier one suppliers. Those are the ones that uh, provides components to the OEMs. So we have, for example, uh, Magneti Marelli that is doing uh, uh, electronic control unit for uh, engines, for uh, suspension, uh, for uh, the body computer. We will learn about that later on. Uh, for infotainment. Then we have, uh, for example, TRW. They are looking for uh, people uh, to work on the braking system uh, or uh, on the steering lock system. We have uh, maybe smaller um, uh, tier ones like uh, Metatron. They are specialized in building electronic control units for um, uh, natural gas uh, uh, combustion systems. Uh, they are supplying, for example, the electronic control unit for the um, methane buses of uh, Iveco. Uh, you have Magna. Magna is uh, very active in uh, particular uh, embedded systems uh, that are um, responsible for keeping the, um, uh, the fluids um, in uh, movement within vehicle for uh, uh, cooling purposes uh, or for, uh, um, I would say, uh, the comfort of the people inside the vehicle. So there is a plethora of other companies that can hire you. And then around this OEM and tier one, there are the tier twos. These are those companies 
that provides either people or services to the tier one and to the OEM. And here, well, you just can give a name and it is here. We have Altran, Teoresi, TXT, Itas, uh, and then a plethora of other uh, smaller uh, companies that are uh, um, active in the automotive uh, industry. So I think that uh, given this, uh, let me say, scenario here in Torino, it is good to have uh, at least uh, uh, an understanding of the different topics that are relevant today for the automotive domain, because maybe you can uh, end up being interviewed by uh, people in, belonging to this company. So I think that uh, having knowledge of the processes that are needed, the methods, and also the tools, this is something that we will uh, come back in a minute, uh, it is relevant for shaping a good CV that becomes appealing for this, uh, uh, for this kind of companies. Then, if you are not looking for a work uh, uh, in the automotive industry, well, the content of this course is not uh, useless because uh, you will learn that uh, when you move to a different domain, let's say biomedical uh, uh, appliances or another domain like uh, aerospace uh, uh, applications, you will end up with the same procedures, with the same technology, with the same methods. They are regulated under different standards. So the name of the standard will not be ISO 26262, will be most likely DO 178. But this will not make a big difference. Once you understand the concept, you can export this, that concept in a different domain. So I think that is a value for you uh, going through the material that I'm presenting here. And that's why I, am, I shape this course in this way. Uh, to even convince you more about this, because here we have an heterogeneous mix. There are students from mechatronics. Can you raise your hand, please? Okay, thank you. Go down. And then there are students from uh, computer engineering. I think it is the rest of you. So you, could you raise your hand, please? Okay, perfect. Thank you. So uh, here we have an heterogeneous mix. So uh, are the roles of different type of uh, backgrounds the same in a company? Obviously not. The people that are from mechatronics engineer will follow a certain path within a company. The people from computer engineer will, will follow a different path. So let me try to explain you uh, which are the different roles that you can uh, have to play with uh, when entering in the automotive industry. And let's try to motivate why having the same knowledge can be helpful. So let's take as an example this application so here we have an internal combustion engine. Uh, by chance, this I think is something uh, produced by General Motors that is uh, sitting behind us, uh, beside us. Uh, well, if you look into the architecture of a modern engine, besides uh, the metal, uh, the the the, old, the, uh, the gears that you have here, all the different moving uh, parts that you have here, you will find. Uh, a box like this one. This is the electronic control unit. The electronic control unit is the unit responsible for keeping the engine operational. So the engine could work even if one piston is not working. Okay? But if this little stuff here is not working, the engine cannot work. No brainer. And given the current regulations in terms of emissions, you cannot have any chance of being able to produce an engine that is able to withstand the current regulations in terms of emissions if you don't have an electronic control unit. Okay? So whatever the other uh, colleague of mine are saying, uh, you have to remember that mechanics is important, fluidodynamics is important, uh, energy distribution is important, everything is important. But if you don't have hardware and software, your car will not move. Your engine will not start working, okay? So don't underestimate the value of the hardware and software on the vehicles of today. 
And the same also applies to other uh, industry. Think about uh, the um, uh, Eurofighter Typhoon. That's a, a fighter jet. That jet is uh, intrinsically unstable. So if the computer that is uh, responsible for moving all the, um, the elements uh, on the surface of the wings of that plane is not doing uh, its work uh, properly, the plane cannot fly. So without that type of correction that happens uh, every hundreds of time per second, the plane is not able to stay in air because it is uh, not stable. So here is the same. If you don't have the hardware and software running properly, the engine will not work, the car will not move. Then, <coughs> now that I convince you that uh, software is important here, let's have a look at the architecture of this electronic control unit. So, to bring this to the extreme essential, here we have an hardware. This is something that implements an embedded computer. So in essence here, we have a CPU, we have memory, we have IOs, the, same, the very same way we have on our computers. What is different here is that uh, this hardware has been designed to serve a single purpose, keeping this operational. This means that the hardware will have <coughs> the correct interfaces for reading uh, the, uh, the proper sensors that tells uh, which is the that tell which is the status uh, of the engine, and uh, the other here will be equipped with the proper uh, outputs to control uh, the throttle, to control uh, the sparkle, for example, to control the injector and so on and so forth. So this hardware will be designed specifically for a single purpose, keeping the engine the engine working. Then, if we, sorry, if we analyze uh, the software that is uh, running uh, on top of this hardware, we can find two big layers. There is uh, the bottom layer, the one closest to the hardware, that is uh, the basic software. So the software that we have here, the basic software, is not uh, providing any particular application. So the basic software is not able to run the engine. The basic software is able to connect the application software through the hardware to the engine. So you have to imagine that the basic software is a kind of operating system with all the drivers that are needed for reading the angular position of the engine and for deciding that it's time to start the injection. So here on the basic software we have, let's say, the operating system and the drivers for uh, the activity that we have to implement to keep the engine running. These activity are decided by the application software. So the top of the stack here is the real software that implements the engine control unit, that implements the control of the exhaust gas to recycle valve so that uh, when uh, the exhaust system tell us that the engine is pushing too much pollution in the air, we keep the exhaust gas recycling within the combustion chamber so that we try to uh, burn them again to reduce further the emissions. So here is where the real intelligence lies. So here is where we have uh, the capability of keeping this engine operational. Well, if uh, we try to map uh, these different type of uh, components that are running on our electronic control unit uh, with the skills that uh, you are uh, bringing, uh, having selected a certain curricula, we can say that uh, the application software is uh, where the domain experts shall work. So, if you are an expert on uh, uh, control algorithms, if you are an expert on uh, uh, mechanics, if you are an expert on uh, combustion, well, here is where you have to work. So here, you will be asked to design 
the control algorithm. The control algorithm, so is uh, most of the time uh, uh, under the responsibility of uh, mechatronic engineers uh, that uh, by knowing uh, how to interact with uh, uh, mechanic persons, with, uh, um, uh, let's say, people with skill on uh, energy can understand how a controller shall be designed. So here is where those of you belonging to the mechatronic domain will spend most of the time. Clearly, you need to have knowledge of what is awaiting besides, below you. So the application software that we have to write here that will be based on model that will be uh, generated automatically, will be translated automatically into C code using proper tools, must withstand certain limitations. Give you an example. Let's imagine that uh, you have uh, a certain uh, system that is able to schedule uh, tasks uh, every 200 milliseconds. So your algorithm that is responsible for uh, computing the quantity of air, the quantity of fuel, and the time for uh, sparkling the uh, ignition should run within 200 milliseconds. This is because you have some uh, limitation coming from the hardware and the basic software. If you are not aware of this limitation, you may end up with an algorithm that uh, tries to inverse a matrix uh, in 200 milliseconds, and there is no way for that algorithm to be able to be uh, deployed in that uh, sheer amount of time that you have. Well, I'm not just giving a, fun, a funny uh, example. This happened. Uh, so in order to develop a proper control algorithm that will result in proper application software, you have to know which are the limitations, which are the constraints coming from the basic software. Let's imagine that you want to design a new uh, control algorithm that requires um, uh, sampling the pressure in the common rail of your engine uh, with a, a frequency of uh, 100 kilohertz. But then your hardware is able to provide samples only once every 10 kilohertz. So you can imagine that you will be able to design the most beautiful algorithm, but then no way of implementing that due to the limitation of the uh, basic software and the hardware. So even if you are not expert in uh, operating system, in uh, stuff that are uh, the realm of computer engineer, you need to have a basic knowledge of what is below the application. Otherwise, your application will not run, no way. Then, when uh, we look uh, to the basic software, here it is uh, the, I would say, the realm of the software ex experts, like those of you that are coming from computer engineering. Here, the task will be to take the application software and make it running through the basic software on top of this hardware. So you will take the software, the application software that somebody will uh, write for you, and you will integrate this on your uh, computing platform through the services provided by the basic software. So here, you don't need to have a very good knowledge of uh, the control theory and all the physical phenomena that are around uh, the system that you want to control. But anyway, it is better if you have that understanding. Otherwise, uh, you will uh, not know what you are integrating on your uh, hardware. And so maybe you will uh, not provide the needed attention where, when that attention is needed. So again, it is important even for those of you that are from uh, computer engineering, so that are the software expert, to have a knowledge of the application software and the underlying hardware, obviously. If you have to sample a signal using a certain ADC that is working in a certain manner with a certain resolution, using a certain channel and uh, responding to a center, certain interrupt, well, these are things that you have to know looking into the hardware. Eventually, there is the hardware, well, there is nobody from computer, in, from electronic engineer here, I think. Is there anybody? 
Okay, you. Maybe from the past year. Uh, so, why it's important for hardware guys to have an understanding of what is uh, waiting uh, above uh, the hardware? Simply because the hardware shall be able to provide the services that are needed for the specific application that we have to deal with. If you have to control the coils that are uh, inside the, uh, uh, the injectors that allows you to insert uh, uh, the desired quantity of uh, gasoline in the combustion chamber, well, it is best if you design a specific hardware that is able to provide the, car, the proper current profile so that the coil is energized for the proper time with the proper sequence of operation uh, in such a way that uh, it is very easy for the basic software development and for the application software developer to implement uh, their uh, task. So also for the hardware uh, developer, it is important to have an understanding of these uh, uh, concepts. Okay, then let's move forward. Uh, now I'm trying to put uh, the topic of the course in the perspective of the development model that is used in the automotive industry. Uh, as I was saying at the beginning of the lecture, <coughs> when uh, entering the industry, you will be part of a team. You will have to withstand some uh, best practice <coughs> rules that uh, through years of experience uh, have been consolidated, and those are the rules uh, that uh, provides, uh, I would say, a good confidence on the success of each uh, uh, design uh, activities. So the reference development model that is adopted in the automotive industry is called V model. The V model is uh, shaped like uh, the V letter, as you can see here. You have a descending branch here, and then you have uh, an ascending branch here. Uh, if we look into the uh, descending branch, we have that every design starts from requirement analysis. So first you have to understand what you want to do. Then you have to specify the functionalities that are needed for fulfilling the requirements. Then you have to define <coughs> the overall architecture of your system. So which are the components that I, that I have to put it to work uh, in order to fulfill these functional specifications? Once this is done, you have to go through the design, the tally design of each component. At the end of this, you will have the need for writing the code. So sorry if I... Uh, Maybe I am, uh, uh, let's say, destroying all your confidence, but code is just the minimal part of uh, all the design uh, process. So if you are uh, very in love with programming, well, I'm happy for you. This is valuable for your uh, career, but uh, code is not the most important part of a design. Probably code is the last thing that you have to take care of. As far as automotive industry is concerned, the process is key. The process requires a number of steps, and you have to go through them. And the code is probably the last step in a long design chain. Then once you have the code, you can start the ascending branch of the V model. So you will have to test adequately each component that you developed to verify that uh, the behavior of the component under any circumstances is uh, compliant with the specification. Then once uh, each component has been tested uh, adequately, you integrate them and then you test again to check whether the integrated uh, components are still behaving as expected. Then when you are happy with that, you can deploy your system in the 
application. So you will start testing how your hardware and your software works within the system that you have to deal with. And then when you are happy with this, you can ship everything to the customer, hoping that it is satisfied. Well, all of this is very strictly regulated by the ISO 26262 that we will follow. And uh, I will try to give you a glimpse of what it takes uh, to develop uh, according to this uh, model. Then, uh, how this maps uh, with uh, the topic uh, of this course? Well, uh, in terms of uh, requirement analysis and functional specification, we will look into ISO 26262 as guidelines for doing these um, activities. As we will learn in the rest of the class, uh, we will see that uh, our software, as well as our hardware, have uh, safety implications. This means that if something goes wrong, your airbag, for example, deploys too late to save your life, or your uh, steering lock locks when you're driving. These are things that could happen. Uh, there is no way out of this. Hardware will fail sooner or later. And uh, if uh, these fails are not uh, taken into the proper consideration, somebody will die, roughly speaking, okay? This is the real concept. If your software fails, somebody will die. So we want to avoid this. We will see later on that uh, somebody overlooked this and there have been severe effects on this misconception of the design. So we need to have a process to address the requirement analysis and the functional specification to understand how critical our software is. Is something dying out of an error here? How likely this is to happen? Is this something that we have to take care of, or is this something that is so remote that we can neglect? We, have to weigh a way, we need to have a way for taking these decisions. And for this, we will use the ISO 26262. Then we have to design our system. We have to define an architecture. This is because we have to reason on what, on what we want to deploy before starting coding, because if we analyze carefully the architecture of the system, we can end up with a more effective architecture and so that we have to spend time encoding only what is really essential. We will deal with AutoSAR as a way for specifying architectures. Then we will do design. We will do design through models. So we are not going to write in C code the uh, algorithm to filter a signal that is needed for understanding whether our uh, uh, braking system is working correctly or not. No way of doing that. We will model our controller using Simulink. We will see that there are plenty of, uh, of uh, description languages, let me say, for this task. We will use Simulink. This is because it is the de facto standard in industry. If you look into what GEM is doing, if you look into what uh, uh, FCA is doing, they are using Simulink heavily. So we will uh, use that as well. Then uh, we will see how the models can be used for validating in advance the proper operations of our controller. So we'll do a lot of model in the loop testing here. Then, when we are happy with what we obtained, we will translate the model into code automatically. This is another important asset. Uh, most of you is from mechatronics. Maybe some of you attended uh, some programming class. Maybe some of you had the chance of attending the class of uh, Professor Serra. So maybe you have uh, the chance of uh, fighting with C programming. We want to avoid that. It's too time consuming, it's too error prone. So C code will be derived automatically from models. And for this, we will, we will use embedded coder. It is uh, one of the tools that Matox provides uh, for uh, deploying uh, production code starting from models. 
then we will uh, uh, validate uh, our soft through a formal approach, and for this we will use polyspace, and through testing. Uh, for this, we will need uh, hardware, because uh, once we end up with our software, so with our code, we will have to bring this software into a piece of hardware, and we want to test this, how it works on the real hardware. For this, this is, a, let's say, a new entry of this year, we will use a national instrument, MyRio platform, that is a platform that allows you to write models of your plant. Let's say you can model uh, your engine using this uh, rapid prototyping tools so that you will have a piece of hardware that works on your, uh, on your desk uh, that behaves exactly as uh, the system that you have to control. Then we will connect our hardware, running our software on uh, the simulated plant and we'll check whether everything is working fine or not. So this is to give you, let's say, a perspective of the content of this class with respect to the reference development model of um, the automotive industry. Then let me move uh, forward and let me uh, start going in more uh, detail about what you need to attend successfully this class. So let me say one thing uh, first. Uh, I think it is evident from uh, what I said uh, until now, but let me say this again. Uh, this course is not intended for teaching you how to pass the exam, okay? I, am the, I have the ambition of teaching you something that will enrich your CV, okay? So this is not an exam factory. So I am not here to tell you how you should address exercises to pass the exam. I am trying to give you some skill that you can spend on your CV. Like it or not, this is my point of view because I think this is a service that I can give you as a student of the last year that will enter uh, in the industry soon, okay? This is not the first year when you have to screen you out to see whether you are able or not to complete uh, an engineering degree. So here we are, you are almost to the end of your engineering uh, curricula. So sooner or later you will become engineers. So it's better for you if you have some skills that you can spend directly six months from now, 12 months from now when looking for a job. So in order to fulfill this goal, I am strongly convinced that uh, you have to experiment because uh, uh, as somebody said, uh, if you do things, you learn things. If you just read or listen, you will maybe remember or understand. But uh, if you don't practice, you don't know. So for fulfilling this, you need to have a notebook. In this class, there are plugs. Uh, I'm, I ask you to stay here because uh, you will have the chance of connecting your laptop in class. So you need a notebook. How many of you already has a notebook? Could you, could you raise your hand? Okay, practically any of you, that, all of you, sorry. That's perfect. Then you need to have, <coughs> you need to have MATLAB, Simulink, Stateflow, Embedded Coder, and Polyspace installed. No problem, this is provided through you officially by Politecnico di Torino. We, I know that students are very able to get uh, the software needed in different through different channels, okay? This is not the case. Uh, Politecnico have uh, an academic uh, alliance with the MathWorks. You are entitled to download and install uh, properly, I would say, uh, all the software from the MathWorks through the Politecnico, okay? So you can download this software, you can install this software on your laptop, you can use it, and you will use it. Then you need an embedded hardware that you have to buy. I will more explain more about this in a minute. And then you will need to have the MyRio board from National Instrument, I will provide that, okay? So you have to do an investment on this course. 
This is the time where uh, many of you may start to argue and say, oh, how come, how is it possible that I have to have uh, an embedded hardware that I have to pay on my own pocket uh, to attend the class? So this is normal reaction. Okay, let's try to justify this. So let's imagine that uh, I say, okay, if you want to pass the exam, you have to buy these two books. Okay, this is not the case. This is just an example that I'm using to justify why I feel comfortable in asking you a little investment on hardware, okay? So let's imagine that in order to prepare the exam, you need to have two books. One is uh, Better Embedded soft System Software. This is from an author that uh, <coughs> is a very, uh, renowned expert on uh, embedded software for critical applications. And then let's imagine that uh, you also, also need to take model-driven software development, okay? So if you look into Amazon, last time I checked, uh, these are the prices that uh, you have to pay for these books. And these are the number of pages that you have there. So let's try to analyze uh, how we can uh, uh, procure, I would say, these books. Well, as I said, as students, you have uh, different channels of procuring the teaching material. Maybe you want to be legal, and so you decide to buy them, 180 euros. It's uh, quite expensive. Then, let's imagine that uh, you are more, uh, let's say, uh, liberal, uh, and you decide to copy them because you go into the library of Politecnico, you gather them, and then you copy them. Well, I tried to make some computation. I think, I, I don't know if this is uh, still up to date, but uh, last time I checked, this is the charge for uh, photocopying a, a page double phase. So if you want to copy this, you can, uh, you have to spend about 26 euros. This is illegal, okay? But you can do that. Uh, if you want to download this uh, from the web, you can do that. Then you can print. More or less, you will have to invest five euros on paper. Then maybe you are more advanced, you want to come here with uh, your uh, uh, iPad or a tablet or whatever. That's okay, but you have to invest uh, some hundreds of euros for the, not for the iPad or uh, tablet in general, okay? So, uh, if you want, if you have to take the textbook, I would say the investment spans from five euros to 180 euros, okay? Then let's have a look at the plethora of boards that you can find in that range. Well, <coughs> this is not uh, exhaustive. There are many other new boards that are coming out uh, every month, I would say, so uh, I, I'm not uh, putting everything here. But uh, I am saying that uh, I want to use this one. So, as you can see, in between five euros and 180 euros, you have to invest something around 30 euros for this class, affordable, I think, for uh, each of you. Okay, if you are not convinced yet, let me try to do this. Could you raise your hand if you have a smartphone? Okay. Then, this is the price for Samsung. This is the price for Apple. This is the price for uh, Windows Phone. This is the price for the rest of the world. You can find here nothing below 30 euros, okay? So if you can afford the smartphone, I think you can, you can afford the board. But maybe you say, ah, oh, no, no, I'm not happy. I, I, I already have too much expenses. How many of you go dancing or having a pizza on Saturday? Okay. So I tried to check. I don't know if this is still up to date, but more or less I think yes. So if you go for a pizza plus a drink and dancing, <laughs> It's 40 euros per Saturday, okay? So one weekend, 
is the price of the board that I'm asking you to buy for the class. I think it is uh, something affordable. So 40 euros for a one Saturday night of fun, 40 euros for one semester of fun, okay? <laughs> then, uh, let's have a look uh, at the material. Uh, so basically, this is something that is provided. This is something that you have to procure on, on your own. It is uh, the Freedom K64 board. Then there are Arduino connectors. Then there is this uh, uh, ultrasonic sensor plus a USB cable. I will give you more details about this uh, soon. Uh, let me just say that uh, as I understand that uh, this could be anyway an expenses that you have to withstand, uh, I am uh, negotiating with the producer of the board to have a discount, okay? So we will not need this immediately, okay? So you can wait procuring this. Uh, in the meantime, I am negotiating for a discount on that. I think it could be something in the range of 25%, more or less. It is not that much, but uh, it is better than nothing, okay? So be informed that you need this. Be informed that you will need this probably one month from now. Uh, don't start procuring this because uh, I am negotiating for the discount, okay? I will keep you informed about this. Then, uh, what is the layout of the class? There will be <coughs> lectures. Uh, some of these lectures we require to do practical activities here. So you will be informed when you have to bring your laptop and the board and the, all the other stuff because we have to do things together here in class, okay? Then there will be seminars. This is, I think, very important because, as I said, you have to uh, attend this class to have, I think, a perspective of what is waiting you outside Politecnico. And so we'll bring here some uh, companies to give uh, seminars uh, either on specific topics like the Matworks. They will talk about formal verification using Polyspace. It is the tool that we have here. So I think that uh, uh, they are the best one that can introduce you to the tool before we start using them. Then there will be national instruments here. As I said, we are going to use uh, MyRio and LabVIEW on top of MyRio. Uh, National Instruments is coming here to teach us how to use this tool. Then I can announce that there will be also FCA. We will have the responsible for the software methodologies in uh, FCA coming here to give a talk. So I think this is important to have a perspective of what is waiting you outside Politecnico. In terms of teaching material, as I said, we have, I have the hands out of the lecture. They are already on Portada Didattica. Uh, you already have a bunch of material there. You can uh, download it and you can uh, have it attend when you come to lecture. Uh, I will regularly post uh, uh, new material there. I think that uh, most of uh, the things that we need are already there. I still have uh, to add some exercises and some uh, uh, exam examples, uh, but this will come in due time. Then there are audio video recording of the lectures. Uh, as you can see, we are here because we have the AV setup from Politecnico. Everything will be recorded and you will have access to this uh, uh, at home. Uh, so if you cannot attend the class because you have overlapping uh, with another uh, class, as uh, some of you already told me about uh, Friday morning, no problem. There are the video lectures, so you can take uh, that. Uh, Everything that I am presenting here will be recorded. So I think that uh, this is a valid uh, support uh, for you. Uh, some administrative stuff uh, about uh, class and lab hours. We will always meet in this class. So Wednesday, 8.30, 10, Friday, 8.30, uh, I think it is 11.30. Uh, this is a mistake from me, uh, sorry. Then uh, what about the tools? As I said, uh, 
your laptop, the software, the board, this is the board, this is the sensor, and then wiring and micro USB. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, take this as a reference. Uh, I will uh, give you notice about when the discount is finalized and how to buy the boards with this discount. Uh, for the sensor, well, <coughs> you can find it either through Amazon in bundles of two pieces, or you can find this on many other uh, e-stores on the web. Uh, use your own, uh, use the store that you are most, um, uh, uh, let me say, that you use the most often. Then you need a micro USB. I think that uh, most of you already have this uh, already. If you have a, a recent phone, it is very likely the chance that you are powering this uh, through micro USB unless you have uh, an Apple device. And then you need some wiring. These are things that you can buy very cheap. Okay. Uh, for the moment, uh, we just need the lectures and uh, pencil and paper because when we do exercises, we do exercises on uh, on paper, okay? So then uh, from, uh, let's say, in one month from now, we'll need also this material. What about uh, the exam? So uh, this year, I decided to change a little bit with compared to the last year because last year, I tried an experiment that uh, doesn't uh, went uh, as I expected. So uh, I decided to change uh, this time. Uh, let me say, if there is anybody here from the past year, we keep the rules of the past year for you, okay? So if you already su uh, submitted uh, uh, one um, assignment, uh, and uh, you already submitted the second assignment, you are waiting for the discussion, or you still have to submit one of the two and you are waiting for the discussion. For me, it's okay if you decide to stay with the past year rules, okay? If you want, you can switch to this year. It's up to you, no problem, but you can choose. For the rest of you, sorry, you cannot choose. This is the way we do exams this year. So there is a written exam a written exam consists typically of, uh, uh, I would say, questions or uh, even better exercise on the ISO 26262 and AUTOSAR. Typically, the scenario is that I provide you an item to design and you have to analyze this item using the what we will learn about ISO 26262. Uh, and then you have to draw the software architecture using uh, AUTOSAR. You will learn how to do this, so uh, don't worry now. This will be evaluated from 0 to 33. Then there will be an assignment. As I said, <coughs> only if you do things uh, manually, you learn by heart uh, the concept that I want you to, to learn. So I decided to ask to develop an assignment. Uh, you have to design something here. You have to provide me that you are able to test this thing. Uh, you have to provide me that you have a, no, a working knowledge of the concept that I'm presenting here. And you will do model-based design here. Um, this will be evaluated from 0 to 33. And then there will be a linear combination of the two in this way. So 80% exam, 20% assignment. Uh, I decided to give 20% because it is still uh, a sensible amount of uh, uh, points here, but it is not too much, okay? Um, so this is the way in which uh, you can pass this exam uh, this year. Uh, what about the assignment? Well, the assignment uh, is always uh, a problem because uh, uh, in this class I have uh, 219 person enrolled, and uh, 148 are students enrolled in this class for the first time. So it is quite complex to give you an individual assignment. In terms of, uh, let me say, topics that can I propose so that they are uh, different enough uh, for uh, each of you, so that there is no to uh, overlapping, I would say, between the different assignments that are delivered. Uh, but I still uh, am 
really convinced uh, that uh, doing assignment is important to understand things. So I decided uh, to switch to the teamwork. Teamwork is encouraged. Uh, at the end, uh, when you go working, you will not uh, uh, self-standing, so you will have to work in a team. Each person in the team brings different competencies. So let's try to encourage this uh, soft skill in you and try to uh, devise assignments that are to be developed using teamwork. Then the assignment we require to analyze a problem using ISO 262 approach, to devise a software architecture using AutoSAR, to design uh, using model driven, and to integrate and test the software on a given embedded hardware. Why three colors? Because I'm expect to have uh, three persons in each team, and I'm expect that more or less this could be the division of tasks among you. Then you are uh, free to do whatever you prefer, but I think that uh, each assignment will require this stuff. And so it is probably reasonable to split the effort among the three players in the team according to this uh, subdivision. Then, if you want to do, each of you, a bit of everything, for me it's okay, it's up to you, okay? Uh, what does this bring us to? Well, as I said, uh, I'm just doing the computation with uh, the, those of you that are attending this class the first time. So there are 148 students, so today, this means that we will have 48 groups of three students plus one group of four persons. But this is not to say that this group has a simpler task than the others, okay? They will have a slightly more complex work to do to be consistent with the more uh, uh, resources that are in that team. Then, if some of you from the past year wants to take the new rules, we can uh, uh, split this um, in uh, two groups so that we have uh, um, the same level of complexity for uh, the due number of uh, uh, groups made of three persons. Uh, you have friends, you have colleagues you are used to work with, so take uh, yourself the responsibility of forming the groups, okay? You can decide uh, with whom you want to work with, it's up to you, okay? But three groups, oh, sorry, but 48 groups of three students plus one of four persons, okay? Then, what about uh, contacts? Send me an email. Uh, I am available in, uh, in the department. Uh, but uh, best if you write me. Uh, I could have uh, some latency in replying, depending on what I have to do, but I will reply, okay? Uh, all the material is available through Portada Didattica, so uh, take uh, that as reference for uh, what you want to have from this class. As I said, uh, part of the teaching material is already there, practically, all the lectures for ISO 26262 and for AutoSAR, uh, and then uh, some of the topics about model-based design. As I said, I still have to upload uh, exams example and exercises, they will arrive uh, in the due time. Uh, okay, is there any question, doubts, uh, comments that you want to bring forward? Okay, there is a question about the delivery of the assignment. Good question. Uh, well, I, I will ask you to deliver the assignment by the end of the exam period of this semester. So this means uh, end of July. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, you may think it is an extra effort uh, on your shoulder during the exam period, but on the other hand, uh, is a way for avoiding you to uh, keep waiting to submit the assignment endlessly, okay? So better if there is a deadline so that you can organize your work and you can deliver the assignment by that deadline. So it will be end of July. 
Then, uh, if there is a very important issue that you have to deal with uh, and you want to have an extension, let me know. But in general, I will set the rule for uh, end of July. If you want to have an exception to that rule, uh, please contact me and we can discuss about uh, why you need to that, have that extension. Then if you want to deliver earlier, that's okay. No problem. But I will send, we'll set the deadline as end of July. Okay? Any other question? Yeah. No, there is no chance of changing the class. There are empty places here, uh, here and there, so there is a possibility for you to, to sit here. But then you will see that uh, uh, in uh, two weeks' time, uh, less and less people will be here because uh, most of you, you will use the recording. I am uh, pretty sure that uh, due to the fact that we start lecture at 8.30, most of you will prefer to sleep and look uh, at the lectures online. I know that. Yeah, so, okay. Is it needed to mix groups depending on the bachelor background? No, there is no special need in mixing the groups depending on the bachelor backgrounds. Uh, it would be nice to have that, but uh, you are not uh, evenly distributed. Uh, I think uh, most of you is from mechatronics and few of you are from uh, computer engineering, so I cannot uh, mix them together. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, uh, there are some of us that just finished the three-year degree. We are not enrolled yet in the, the two-year one, so we are not taken into account in the capital. So you're saying that some of you hasn't yet uh, uh, officially enrolled in the class because you are fresh from the bachelor. Okay, uh, this could be the case. Uh, it uh, would be more complex to deal with because the number of groups will increase. So the number of uh, assignments that they have to, rec to correct will increase, but this is not a, a big deal for you. When you are uh, enrolled officially, uh, you will be forming a group and that's okay. Um, I think, are you already able to access Portada Didattica? Okay, so here we have two problems. If you are just fresh out from bachelor and you are enrolling in this class, but not yet officially, you don't have access to the teaching material. If this is the case, please send me an email. I will insert you among the students that have access to the material. Um, in a, any case, uh, sooner or later, you will be appearing on my uh, student list. And so you will be enabled, and then when uh, forming the group, uh, I will take care of you. Uh, anyway, the rule is three persons. So try to uh, make groups of three persons. Then if there is uh, one person alone or two persons alone, they will join with uh, uh, a three people group to form a four people group. Uh, once you have done with the group, um, formation, send me the email of the group members so that I can keep track of whom is working with, okay? But, uh, well, today is the first lecture. We have time to put this at work because uh, I will not announce uh, the, the assignment uh, since, uh, well, I would say uh, probably end of March. So you have time to be officially enrolled uh, and form the group, okay? Any other question? Okay, so let me give you uh, an announcement. We have a lecture on Friday, so we'll start uh, looking into the teaching material. So please uh, have uh, the handout available by that time. They are already on Portada Didattica, so it's just a matter of downloading them or either printing them or bringing the, the computer with you. Uh, and then uh, next Wednesday, there will be no lecture. This is because I am on a trip for Politecnico. I'm not in Italy, so I cannot give lecture. We will have lecture this Friday and next Friday, okay? I will post on Portada Didattica a calendar I am not done yet, please. 
uh, I am posting on Portale de Didattica a calendar with the scheduling. So you will know when there will be lecture and when there will not be lecture. Today, I am planning to have only a couple of uh, no-shows due to trips, uh, and then there are obviously the, the vacation due to the Easter break, okay? Okay, thank you very much, see you on Friday. <laughs>